Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome again to Grand Rounds. Um, today is our crossroads in psychiatry in which we pair um, McLean Hospital affiliated scientists who are doing research, uh, usually basic um, research, uh, with a scientist clinician um, who can talk about the clinical applications of the research that we're going to hear about. And we are going to be focusing today on pediatric OCD. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our two speakers, Dr. Alex Dainadai. He's a translational data scientist who focuses on improving pediatric mental health outcomes. He and his team take new findings in computer science, mathematics, and statistics and translate them into clinically actionable information. He has applied new developments in machine learning and health economics to a number of conditions, including anxiety, OCD, PTSD, autism, ADHD, substance addiction, and self-harm. Dr. Uh, Dayton Dai has also developed a mentorship-based data science training program for first-generation students from diverse backgrounds. Uh, and he's going to be joined by Dr. Maria Frere, who is the program director of the OCD Institute for Children and Adolescents, our OCD junior program at McLean Hospital. She's a licensed clinical psychologist and specializes in the treatment of severe anxiety, OCD, and co-occurring disorders, specifically using cognitive behavioral therapy and exposure and response prevention. And we are going to hear from Dr. Frere first, and then we will hear from Alex afterward. So uh, I will turn it over to Dr. Frere. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm going to start us off by talking about the clinical aspects of pediatric OCD. We're going to start talking a little bit about the past, where this sort of started. But a bulk of my presentation will be on the present and talking a little bit about diagnostics and treatment of pediatric OCD. So when we think about OCD historically, it was once considered a very rare and untreatable condition. That is how people used to talk about OCD in adults, um, starting as early as the 60s. It wasn't until about the 70s that you'll even find pediatric OCD in the literature. And the first medication clinical trial for pediatric OCD was in the 1980s. And about 20 years later, you'll start seeing clinical trials using cognitive behavioral therapy and cognitive behavioral therapy combined with medication. And about 20 years now later, our gold standard treatments are still using these cognitive behavioral therapy techniques combined with medication and other evidence-based modalities. So while we have come a ways, and we'll talk a bit about what this looks like now, we are definitely looking forward to how we'll build on this in the future. So how we talk about OCD in kids. When we talk about this, we're thinking about obsessions that will present in kids. And these are unwanted, distressing, intrusive thoughts, images, urges. And they're combined with compulsions, rituals, these repetitive behaviors that are aimed at preventing this feared outcome, this obsession, trying to neutralize this distressing feeling that they may be experiencing. And these experiences of obsessions and compulsions can be uh, a wide range of impairment levels. They may be miles, they may only take up a few minutes of one's day, but they can range all the way to significantly impairing, spending hours and hours of a day obsessing over these very feared outcomes, engaging in these very challenging rituals, and can impact, and pretty significantly so, a child's relationships with their family, with their friendships, their ability to go to school, and engage in the daily meaningful things in their life. And while it was once considered quite rare, actually one in 200 children can experience OCD. And these different uh, themes come up in OCD. And so in reality, OCD can really latch on to anything that your mind can be very anxious and fearful about. It can be anything that's important to you can become a pretty significant fear. But we tend to see clusters of symptoms, particularly in the kids that we see. And so our kids may present with a 
intense sense of responsibility, worried that they're going to do something that will hurt others, worried that something terrible is going to happen to themselves, they're going to be responsible for some terrible event that happens across the world. And when these obsessions and thoughts show up, kids may engage in behaviors where they're checking, they're calling their mom to make sure she didn't get in a terrible accident on the way home. They're seeking reassurance that everybody is okay. Or they're checking themselves. I walked by a knife. Did I accidentally grab it and hurt myself? These are pretty intense thoughts that kids can be managing. And they may try and engage in preventative rituals when these thoughts show up. Well, if I do a certain thing, engage in a certain ritual, then that terrible thing I think about won't happen. Other themes that we see are these very like intrusive, intense, unwanted thoughts related to sex or religion or violence. An image can get stuck in a kid's head. A terrible house fire that happens. Worry that, you know, is grandma in heaven right now? These concerns that if I don't do this thing, I myself will go to hell or send other people there. And while it can be an uncomfortable topic for therapists and parents, kids do experience sexual thoughts with their OCD, a worry that they may be perpetrating against someone else, that something bad will happen to them. And when they have these intense thoughts, they'll try and engage in these rituals to try and neutralize the thought, to try and figure out, okay, I had this thought, how do I manage it? And these rituals will be born. Another subset that we'll often see is this order, symmetry, putting things in a certain way. But what we'll also find, especially with the kids that we might see in the residential, is a number of them experience these not just right feelings. And they can't necessarily articulate what exactly it is. But if I don't do this ritual, it won't feel right. If I don't walk in and out of a doorway three or four times, it just doesn't feel quite right, and I don't know how to manage it. And so when kids are going through these experiences, they're really hard to articulate and understand. And yet the feeling is so intense that it can cause a child to stand on one foot for hours on an end, because if they put it down, it just doesn't feel right. And then the fourth theme that we'll often see is contamination. And this may be more familiar to folks, that more pop culture OCD of concerns about germs or sickness. You know, I have to wash my hands a certain number of times to get rid of the germs. Uh, but in our case, we also see a number of kids with emotional contamination. And this is essentially the idea that they may touch something another person has touched, and then they'll take on the essence of that person. Or there may, may be characteristics of a person that they're worried about have, absorbing themselves, and that's a type of contamination that they worry about. And so when we're going through and we're talking about all these different themes, we're really working with kids to figure out what is your OCD mind told you, what sort of things are very fearful to you, and how are these rituals maintaining these fears? So when we're diagnosing OCD, we're really looking at what kind of level distress is showing up not only for the child, but also for the family who is trying to help this child in significant distress engaging in these very challenging rituals. And we're assessing the unwanted nature of the thought. And this is very important in diagnosing OCD because the thoughts are causing distress for the kids. And this is where we start looking at differentials for OCD, where we're trying to sort out how these thoughts are unwanted, what kind of distress they're causing, and how are the rituals engaging and maintaining these obsessions. And so when I talk about understanding the function of the ritual, we spend a lot of time talking not just about the obsessions and the rituals, but how they may be connected or disconnected. And what I mean by that is that sometimes the rituals, they follow a logical path, right? So a child has a fear of getting sick and they wash their hands. We can all sort of follow that logical connection. But sometimes you'll have the kids who they have to wash their hands seven times in a day for 20 minutes each time. And what you realize when you're talking to them about what's sort of building them up to do that hand washing is actually the fear is that if they don't do that, then their grandmother will die. And so if you don't have that assessment piece of really understanding the connection between the obsession and the ritual, you may miss the thing that you're actually trying to treat. The other thing that we talk about a lot with OCD is anxiety. There tends to be a lot of anxiety related to OCD. There's very comorbid disorder with OCD, but it is not always required for OCD. And that's an important thing to be in mind of. So particularly when we think about our kids going through the not just right experiences, anxiety might not be the word that they use to describe their experience. And so it's an easy to 
miss that subtype of OCD if you're less familiar with it because it doesn't quite fit what we might typically think about. Because OCD actually is associated with a wide range of emotions, not just anxiety. But if you think about the types of thoughts that these kids may be experiencing, they also experience a fair amount of guilt, shame. If I'm having this thought, it must be true about me. This must mean that I actually want these kinds of thoughts when they're showing up. And that can lead to a lot of hopelessness. And then overarchingly, when we think about OCD, we think a lot about uncertainty, because uncertainty is a core element of OCD. That uncertainty that this terrible thing I'm thinking about might happen if I don't do this ritual. And you can't really talk a kid out of like, no, that's not going to happen. It'll be fine. Like their ritual has really convinced them that they have to engage in it. And that uncertainty of being able to separate out, if I don't do this ritual, this thing may or may not happen, can be really challenging. So when we're looking at treating this after going through and doing a thorough assessment, our main modality of treatment is exposure and response prevention. Fundamentally, exposure and response prevention focuses on exposing the person to that thought, that obsession, that thing that's very hard for them to imagine, and preventing them from engaging in that ritual. So if we think about our OCD cycle, they'll have the thought, it causes them extreme discomfort, uncertainty, anxiety, they engage in this ritual, they feel much better, that's great. But then that cycle continues. And so ERP aims to bring up the thought, but have them not engage in the ritual. And honestly, it qu sounds quite simple, right? I have the thought, just don't do the thing. But we're asking people that have these really significant fears, the scariest thing they can think of, and we're asking them to not do the one thing that makes them feel better, makes them feel safe, makes them feel like they're keeping others safe, and that can be really, really challenging. So we'll do exposures combined with other evidence-based modalities, like medication, good psychopharmacology, uh, but also other treatments like pulling in DBT skills, ACT skills, to really help build them into the treatment. Our treatment themes that we focus on start with motivation, because as I mentioned, we're asking them to do something really, really hard that makes them very, very uncomfortable. And so we'll talk with kids a lot about, okay, why do we want to do this hard thing? And usually the first answer is, I don't want to do this hard thing. It's like, okay, well, what are some things that you want to get back to that OCD has taken away from you? Do you want to be able to go on sleepovers, but it won't let you? Do you want to get back to school, because academic is actually kind of important to you and you want to go to college? Do you want to see your best friends more again, because that's something OCD has taken with you too? So it's important to have that relationship and those discussions with the kids before you launch into doing the exposures. And as we're teaching kids and getting them ready to do exposures, the first thing we start teaching them is how do they allow these really scary thoughts to be there? Because it's a pretty natural process to have a hard thought and want to ignore it, push it away, and just like really, really try not to um, let it dictate everything. Except that's really hard to do. And so the first thing we're teaching is like, how do you let a thought be there? and not let it dictate everything that you do. That a thought can be a thought, that it can be present, but you can still engage in the thing that's important to you. And when we're going through and we're starting to do the exposures, the other theme that we focus on is helping understand the idea that we're not doing exposures to teach that something is safe. Um, and that can be a bit of a misconception about exposures. And that may be something that a kid learns tangentially while doing an exposure. Oh, it turns out the bad thing didn't actually happen. But the skill that we're actually targeting is helping a kid understand that they can manage uncertainty, that they might not necessarily 100% know if something will come true or not come true. And we want them to learn to manage and write out their anxiety and discomfort that they're feeling without having to engage in these very challenging rituals that could be taking up so much time and energy. And then the other theme that we're often discussing is how avoidance is actually not helpful. Avoidance is another thing you can consider as a ritual. It's a really common response to something that causes us anxiety, but it will inadvertently increase your anxiety and decrease the self-confidence that you can manage hard things. And what we want to teach kids is you can do the hard thing even when it's hard. So when we're planning exposures, we really focus on collaborating with the kid in order to do it. And that's critical to get them involved and actually buy in to the fact that they're going to do these exposures. But also important for that piece I mentioned earlier, making sure you're targeting the right thing. 
And so in our program, we talk about building exposure menus. And some of you may be even more familiar with the term exposure hierarchies, where you tend to do things as more gradual, building up. What we have shifted towards menus and think more about here are some low-level exposures, here are some mid-range exposures, higher-level exposures, for a couple different reasons. One, we don't want to teach that exposures have to go in a very planned, organized fashion. Particularly those with OCD, they may get a little stuck in, oh, I have to do the easier thing before I can do the harder thing. And unfortunately, that's not really the way that life works. It doesn't just like let you do things in a controlled, gradual manner. By giving low, middle, high exposure ideas, we're also teaching kids that they'll have a choice in what they want to work on. Some days, you feel more confident. You can do those more mid-level, higher-level exposures. Some days, you want to go back and do the things that you know you have a little more mastery over, because that will help build the confidence in working on these exposures. And then we do the exposures together with the kid. We get a lot of information that way, and we talk through and teach them, OK, what do you think is going to happen? what actually happened? Was it as bad as you thought it would be? Did it turn out differently than you thought it would be? Because that's where a lot of learning comes in the exposure process. So what does this look like in practice? So generally, if we think about the themes that I was discussing earlier, for example, we've got a kid who's really worried that if they don't check the stove multiple times before they leave the house, the house will burn down. So we start by things like, all right, can they walk through the kitchen and resist checking the stove? It might be too much to do that. So can we walk through the kitchen? Can we leave for 20 seconds before we go back in and check? Can we leave for 30 seconds, two minutes? Just extend out that time before moving into fully resisting and checking that stove. Our kids with the intensive thoughts that feel very violent or sexual or um, focused on scrupulosity, religion, we may have them write short scripts about the things that they're worried about that they think might happen and then have them reread it, read it to others, have them carry it around. What we're teaching them is here's this thing that you're worried about and here's how you learn to manage it to take away some of that power. Our kids who might have some of those um, order symmetry, having to do things in a certain way, we're teaching them, okay, how do you mess up that ritual? How do you not give in to OCD 100%? So maybe it's telling you you have to sit down in that chair and stand up four times can we do it three times? Can we do it five times? And then we think about our kids with contamination. We'll have them handle something that's contaminated and then have them resist engaging in their cleaning ritual. And that might not be a full resistance. That might be, okay, can we do it in a different order? Can we do it for a shorter amount of time? Can we do it in a way that feels not 100% clean but 80% clean? And so our, our overarching thing is what does OCD want and what are we not going to give it? And we build that muscle over time. And I was like, okay, how do we listen to OCD less and less? You can't talk about working with kids without talking about their families. And so our kids, they live in these systems, and we want to be able to support these systems that they're going to return to. And so you may have noticed as I talk about OCD, I almost talk about it like a separate entity. OCD mind, OCD does this, OCD is telling you this, this is what it wants. We give families that language too. We explain to them, like, here's a way to shift your language that may feel subtle, but will make a difference to the kid. So, for example, a family may be used to saying, like, Tommy, I really need you to get out of this house. We have to get to school. We need to get going. And instead, we help parents think through, like, okay, Tommy, we need to go. Your OCD is really getting in the way of this. Your OCD is really causing a lot of frustration. What can we do against your OCD together to get out that door? And a lot of the work we do with parents is helping them learn to tolerate their own distress when they see their child in distress, because that's really hard. A natural inclination of a parent is to want to take care of their kid and to not have them feel such anxiety and discomfort and to experience all these thoughts, except that inadvertently might lead parents to accommodate these fears, to plate the kid's food in a way that OCD likes, to buy all the cleaning supplies that OCD needs, um, and so we'll work with parents on how to reduce that accommodation. Um, so well, it was brief and quick on how we diagnose OCD and think about it, how we have these treatments. The main message is we do have these evidence-based treatments that can make a difference in a child's life. And fortunately, here at McLean, we also have multiple programs that can provide intensive services to these kids and families. So we have our McLean Anxiety Mastery Program, which is an intensive IOP. 
And at the OCDI for children and adolescents, we have our partial hospitalization program and our residential services. And this, our hope is to provide these evidence-based treatments to really work with these kids, with these families, but also with communities to help them understand this is what OCD is, this is what it isn't, this is how we diagnose it, and more importantly, this is how we treat it so that people can get back into the lives that we know they wanna live. And with that, I think it would be helpful to hear a bit about the future of pediatric OCD. So yeah, building on our you know, gold standard clinical care that we have ongoing here at McLean, I'd like to talk a little bit about future directions because um, you know, OCD is, uh, you know, we get some of the best treatment responses in all of mental health treatment with OCD treatment. You know, a lot of kids do do a lot better, um, but many also have residual symptoms, especially after first line therapy. And so we're looking at, you know, what can we do to help more kids feel better and I'd like to hit on two major goals that we're looking at then for future directions. So one is how can we help every child receive full symptom remission so that you know, when treatment's done, you know, they are feeling like they don't have OCD anymore, the family can navigate issues. Uh, you know, we don't want kids to feel like you know, something's kind of undone or not quite, you know, not quite ready uh, when they're done with treatment. Uh, and the other is, how can we make sure every child receives gold standard treatment and that, you know, many, many kids uh, either are not treated or, you know, don't find a provider who's experienced in exposure and response prevention. You know, the average uh, person in general actually goes more than a decade with mental health symptoms without being diagnosed. And in children, it's usually even longer, actually. In fact, childhood onsets generally associate with lifelong issues of uh, more severe mental illness, and pediatric OCD is no different. So I'll break that into kind of two parts, and I'd like to present one study each that kind of addresses each of these goals. And so the first one is, how can we use new sources of information that are available and new technologies to make a difference in OCD treatment? And one thing we're looking to do is bring in neural activation as a way to predict which child is going to do well in treatment. So the idea is, could we do a brain scan before treatment and say, well, maybe this child is more likely to respond to exposure and response prevention, while another child might benefit from pharmacotherapy, or there's all sorts of options that are out there, because you know, treatment's a big investment. There's sometimes side effects affiliated with it. So we want to do everything we can to get the right treatment the first time and make the most, uh, most help that we can. So what we've done then is uh, we've collected data from about 130 patients, and we did some brain scans uh, before treatment and tried to see how does that relate to their treatment outcomes and how does that relate to their OCD symptoms as well. Um, all right, so what did we get from it then? Let me, let me explain a little bit. I'll, I'll pull some things together all together here. So at the bottom, these are a bunch of different brain areas. And with them, you know, there's all sorts of different tasks that we have them do. So we have patients do uh, tasks that are related to error processing and interference processing. In a way, th those two di distinctions are actually in a way more important than the actual brain area themselves. So for example, uh, on the left is a bunch of error processing. We look at you know, the default mode network. How does, how does error processing happen there with kids with OCD? Um, and error processing is particularly important for OCD because it's related to a sense of completeness. So like when Maria was saying that you know, children might you know, feel a need to do these, these tasks over and over, uh, one part we're thinking is that they never really feel that tasks are done. Right? You know, so imagine uh, when you shut the door, when it goes from open to shut, you know, an error happens in your brain. Kind of this thing fires off that says something is different. Uh, so if you, you know, never felt like the door was shut, you never felt like your hands were washed, that would be a really frustrating sensation, right? <laughs> um, just like nothing's ever done. And so they're just not getting this emotional feedback that's helpful for them to understand uh, you know, what's actually happening in the world. So we're particularly interested in error processing in this way. And then uh, on the left is we have different levels of brain activation, essentially high, high and low, the middle line is just no activation. 
So if we look at just traditional research approaches, they would reflect this black line I, I just put on the screen, saying there's a pattern of error and interference. Uh, this was actually the main focus of this project that we applied unsupervised machine learning to. And it didn't really, pr actually it was very similar to control participants, kids who didn't have OCD. It didn't really predict treatment outcomes. And so I started collaborating uh, with uh, researchers at University of Michigan and Columbia who were collecting this data. And we talked about, you know, what can we do to figure out, you know, what's going on here? Why is this not lining up with what we'd expect? And so what we did is uh, we looked for subgroups. So that's what unsupervised machine learning is, is best focused on. The idea being that in the real world, in the clinic, you know, we see OCD, we see obsessions, and we see compulsions. But that's probably not just one kind of patient uh, out there, right? It's probably different kinds of people and it's hard to see outwardly, but maybe we can see through their brain patterns and their neural activation patterns that there's different kinds of uh, underlying causes that are leading us to have different types of OCD and maybe different types of treatment response. And that's actually what we found. So we didn't just find one group, we actually found three groups. So the first group, uh, maybe not so eventful, this orange line <laughs> tracks the uh, black line which tracks controls. But we found two others as well. And there's a few notable things about these other subgroups that we found based on their neural activation patterns. Um, so the first is that, you know, they really uh, go either above or below the main group. So that orange group, we see that with the green line, they're underactive on error processing and hyperactive on interference processing. And then vice versa for this blue line. They're hyperactive on error processing and underactive in interference processing. And so this, this has a few implications. So one is, if we pretend all three of these groups are the same, that's just naturally going to increase noise in our data and make it harder to find thing, you know, things that we're looking for in our treatment outcomes and, and what's going on with kids. Another is uh, my collaborators were particularly interested actually in this green line over time with the uh, underactive error processing. And they'd find it in some studies, but then they wouldn't find it in others. And they were kind of wondering whether this was a, a false finding or not. And it looks like it's probably just buried in the data. And if we can use machine learning to pull it out, then we can see, oh, there's this other group of kids uh, who might have these issues with error processing. But sometimes you see it, sometimes you don't. It got kind of lost in the shuffle. So then linking this to treatment outcomes then, you know, we have the same lines at the top. And then we look and it turns out that orange line actually had better treatment outcome with CBT overall compared to uh, stress management therapy, kind of a, a generic, you know, not specific treatment to OCD. So the idea is that with that orange line, it's about two thirds of the sample that we had. And that's roughly the amount of patients who respond right away to OCD treatment. So our hope is that, you know, going forward in the future, you know, before treatment, uh, you know, treatment's a big investment in time and energy. And so we might say that, well, a, a brain scan is, you know, some more time and energy, but it's actually a relatively small commitment at the outset of treatment before making a, a three plus month commitment or more uh, to know, hey, this child might respond to cognitive behavioral therapy and we can link them there first. And then children who might be less likely to respond, you know, maybe we'll start with some other kinds of treatments first and see maybe that would be most helpful and save them the time, the energy. You know, there's the adverse events that can go with treatment. And also just, you know, the frustration that comes with trying a treatment when it doesn't work. Uh, you want to avoid that as much as you can for many reasons. All right. So that addressed the first goal that I was looking to hit on is, you know, how do we make treatments better going forward? You know, one way is using new versions of data science techniques, applying with new forms of data. Um, the second goal we want to hit on then is how can we make sure that every child can receive the best treatments that we have and that relatively few children receive specialized care for pediatric OCD. Um, you know, as I mentioned, you know, many people go for years or even decades without getting the care that they need. And, you can ask any family and, you know, any child who became an adult with OCD, you know, if they were diagnosed three years earlier, five years earlier, you know, what would they have done differently? How would their life have been different? 
You know, they all have, you know, very, it's a very profound you know, thought for them to think about, you know, what they could have done. And we're also seeing, you know, with COVID right now that, you know, with children, you know, having trouble going to school for a long time, how even one year of interference can really slow down child development. You know, imagine, you know, OCD, it's year after year after year of kind of functioning at, you know, maybe 30% less than their capacity because of the OCD. Uh, it's a great burden for children. It's a great burden for families. And it's also a burden for the healthcare system as far as if we're spending time and effort on, you know, treatments that, you know, may not be evidence-based and may not work the first time. Uh, it's, you know, how do we efficiently allocate what we need in society to make a difference? Um, there's the use and the treatment. There's also things like excess ER visits, um, other consequences associated with anxiety that, that, get, that make it difficult. And so we're thinking about, in general, how could every, treat, every child in America get gold standard treatment? And there's been different approaches to this. So a common approach has been to do large-scale trainings of providers. So maybe, you know, two or 300 providers in a state, try to train them up on new types of OCD treatment, you know, update them on, on what's going on. And it's helpful, but, you know, there's just millions of people with OCD and many, many kids. It's just, it feels kind of like you're, you're just chasing over and over. It's, it's hard to keep up. And so what our group has been thinking about is how do we make this broader scale dent in a way that, that still fits with that broad approach? And we're thinking that, you know, who's the person that every child and family interacts with when they have some kind of mental health issue or any kind of health issue, period? You know, they usually, if someone, you know, a child starts having symptoms of OCD, they might not even know what OCD is called. They just know something is wrong. Uh, and so what they do is they call their doctor. They call their insurance company for a referral. Those are the people who are kind of the gatekeepers uh, who every person interacts with in the healthcare system. Uh, whether it's private healthcare in America, uh, it's public healthcare internationally, or things like the VA, and there's like TRICARE for the military uh, families. And so we're thinking if we can help the insurance companies differentially steer resources towards evidence-based care, then naturally we can get the resources steered where they need to be to make a difference with uh, the level of evidence-based care being delivered. But these third-party stakeholders need a form of evidence that usually isn't produced in medical research. Uh, they need evidence uh, from what's called cost-effectiveness analysis. Uh, and so there's you know, obviously two parts to that, right? So effectiveness, we know inside and out. We, know we, this is, we have many clinical trials. Um, but linking cost to it can be surprisingly difficult. Uh, there's many cost estimates out there, but you have to collect a special kind of information to link cost to the effectiveness. And so on this, I've been working with a couple of health economists who work in cardiology, work in diabetes, and we're all just shocked at how little information there is on cost effectiveness in pediatric OCD and frankly, mental health overall. Um, and this means that you know, insurance companies or the government can't know how much they have to allocate to make a difference in these conditions. Do they have to allocate you know, $10 million, $100 million, a $1 billion? Uh, those, <laughs> those all sound like a lot to me, but uh, those are you know, very, very different in the eyes of government stakeholders of what they have to allocate and what they're gonna get back for that too. Uh, and that'll, that'll come into play here. So we see this as a crucial barrier. This lack of information is a crucial barrier to making a big difference in pediatric OCD and uh, in mental health care more broadly. So we wanted to fill this gap. And so what we did is we uh, merged a few different data sources together. So we took uh, insurance claims databases from IBM Watson. Uh, we took uh, broad meta-analyses and we took some uh, data warehouse uh, data sets from the NIMH data archive. And we use what are called decision trees to produce the results that I'll show you in a second. Um, but the idea is, you know, when you allocate resources to OCD treatment, what do you get from it? That's, that's what we wanted to find out. And we also uh, conducted a systematic review to also try to align the results that we found with what's out there. Uh, after looking through 30,000 articles, uh, we found two uh, that were relevant for pediatric OCD. We, we also did look at anxiety and depression as well, so that 30,000 covers multiple things. But nevertheless, uh, there's really a paucity out there because there's only studies that have costs, 
and then studies that only have effectiveness, but rarely are they linked, and you actually have to do them at the same time together. It's very hard to, to link them separately. All right, so what did we find then when we took the data from the various data sources and combined them with supervised machine learning? Well, we looked at a few different treatments. Uh, we looked at antidepressant medication, looked at cognitive behavior therapy, and we looked at the combination of the two. And we looked at two different outcomes. These are common in cost-effective, uh, cost-effectiveness analyses. Uh, one is called the minimum important difference, which is kind of like treatment response. Like, did you have a difference that you notice something is different? Maybe they're not all the way better, they don't have full symptom remission, but they notice like, hey, I did treatment and something got better. That's the minimum important difference. Then a clinically significant difference is a lot closer to remission. The idea is that, you know, there's no longer really an OCD level of symptoms occurring there. And so what we found is that antidepressant medication was the most cost effective. Uh, these actually, they go in order of, they're all effective, and they're actually all cost effective, but they go in order of you spend less and you get a little less, and then you spend more and you get more. So like to get a treatment response with antidepressant medication, we estimate that's about $2,000 of investment when you consider you know, clinical visits, you know, medication costs, which are fairly low now with generic drugs, uh, but even then, there's a lot of monitoring and investment that goes on. And then to get the full remission, we're looking at more like 9,000 there. Then with cognitive behavioral therapy, a little higher, you know, 3,000 for uh, response, 12,000 for remission. And then for both, uh, if you put them together, you get a little bit better outcomes, you know, 5,000 uh, for response and 20,000 for remission. And so, you know, we found that, you know, we have these numbers affiliated with the outcomes, but, you know, what do these mean? They're kind of just out there, uh, out there uh, in the ether. Um, the anchor that's usually used in cost effectiveness analysis is called a willingness to pay threshold. And so this is actually the exact same graph that you just saw, but the scale is on the willingness to pay threshold, where uh, here the, on the y-axis we've got dollars and about $100,000 per year of quality of life is what insurance companies usually use to anchor on whether a treatment is cost effective. Sometimes it's 50,000 as well, a little bit lower, but as we can see, everything is well under even this $50,000 barrier. So the idea is that, you know, any treatment we have, you know, they work and they're also cost effective in a way that, uh, you know, if you th it's not often recognized in healthcare, but the treatments we have are some of the most cost-effective treatments in all of healthcare when you think about what you get. And that, you know, if someone has a broken arm, you hope that never happens, but if it does, you know, you get a cast and you kind of, if you get back to school, you can still hang out with friends, you, you know, as an adult, you can get back to work, you can still kind of get on with things. Whereas if you have OCD, that's, you know, 40% of your life you lose year after year after year that you, you never really get back. And so these are chronic, long-term conditions, and also the costs are, are lower than, you know, let's say like a hip surgery or, or something like this. So we're optimistic that if we can keep showing this, we can really help differentially steer kids towards evidence-based care. So broadly, uh, you know, that second study, you know, all gold standard treatments we saw, not only do they work, but they're also cost-effective. And you know, this addresses a key bottleneck to getting more services out there that could help kids. Um, and so we focus mostly on the individual level of you know, what this means for what children spend. But you know, next steps and what we can think of more broadly are you know, what does society get back for that? In that if there's fewer ER visits, there's fewer uh, you know, doctor's visits for things that are just not OCD related. Um, you know, this could reduce healthcare system usage that we can use to help treat other mental health disorders or other diseases overall. And also, you know, eventually it kind of, it, it really pays for itself. That's not, the goal is to figure out how can we help the most kids. But it turns out every time we run the models, I mean, you look and, you know, when people pay more taxes when they get back to work or, you know, they get back to school, uh, you know, even just the most simple th way of thinking about it is, you know, when a child becomes an adult, if we can help them, you know, get a better job because we re reduce their OCD and they make $1 more an hour, 
that's $2,000 more a year for the rest of their life that they receive and that, that's kind of put back into the system. And so we're looking at how do we put all these things together? It really seems like a win-win for everyone involved. All right, so then just overall, the future directions uh, that we're looking at in OCD care. So again, you know, how do we improve current treatments? You know, one way is we have a lot of great treatments. How can we optimize them? How can we concentrate them? How can we reduce the side effects associated with them? You know, there's new data available, new data science techniques available to get at them. We showed one with fMRI. Um, another is to combine new clinical innovations with data science approaches. So for example, uh, for patients uh, who have treatment refractive OCD, uh, deep brain stimulation is kind of a, a, not even a second line treatment, but further down the line, it can be very, very effective for kids and adults who have had symptoms that are really, really uh, impairing to the point of nutrition issues, uh, you know, major quality of life issues. But, you know, with, you put, you know, it's a very serious intervention. You wanna, you know, reduce the invasiveness as much as you can. And one way is to adjust the stimulation by using machine learning. And that if you can automatically detect when an obsession is happening and then only deliver current when the obsession is happening, you don't have to stimulate the brain the entire time. You can reduce the stimulation quite a bit. And so we're also thinking just along the lines of how can we combine new technologies with you know, exciting new treatments that are out there and put these together. Then in terms of dissemination, again, we're trying to dovetail what we're doing with what's already out there. So for example, the International OCD Foundation has many you know, excellent trainings you know, running you know, throughout the year where they train many new clinicians out there and how can we differentially steer care uh, to kids who need it, you know, putting these together. We're, we're very excited about providing key stakeholders the necessary information that they need to then uh, make a difference at the you know, scale of millions and tens of millions of people. So with that, uh, you know, we're very excited about the gold standard care being provided here at McLean, and we're very excited about the opportunities that are coming from new research directions and the opportunity to collaborate clinically and through research at McLean. And so at this time, you know, we'd appreciate the chance to address any questions and feedback. Thank you. <clears throat> if people have questions, uh Raise your hands and we'll come to you with a microphone. Hi, um, great talk, thank you. Uh, I actually have two questions if there's time, but um, the first one is just that I've heard that OCD tends to be very high insight in that people with OCD tend to know that their rituals aren't necessarily preventing their fear. And I was just curious if that is something that is different in pediatric cases, especially with the younger ages where they might not fully understand it and if you have found that you have to account for that in a certain way with treatment, like incorporating psychoeducation or something like that. That sounds like a me question. Um, <clears throat> I would say that there's actually quite a, a range of insight in OCD in terms of treatment response. Insight definitely has an impact on that. In pediatrics in particular, we will spend a lot of time in psychoed explaining sort of what OCD is to help people figure out where it might be showing up in their lives. Um, and so I would say that definitely building insight is something that we'll spend some time on. But I would argue it's, that's true pediatrics and adults because we know how important it is to like the treatment gains that they could engage in. Okay, thank you. Um, and I guess just really quickly, the other one is with some of the more like magical thinking kinds of OCD, have you experienced any difficulty with the younger end of pediatrics differentiating between it actually being something that is OCD versus something like the child's imagination having, I could see there being some overlap there and is it maybe the level of distress that decides or if there's ever been a gray area with that? Yeah, that's a great question, particularly with our younger kids and figuring out what's developmentally appropriate versus what might be OCD. And you kind of answered your own question in there um, because it is that like level of distress. How much discomfort are these thoughts having? And then especially with younger kids, we're looking at rituals because sometimes the behaviors are easier to identify 
amplified and the kids being able to articulate their internal experience. Um, but definitely in pediatric OCD, we're looking a lot at like what's developmentally appropriate right now for this kid and where does it feel like it's diverging? And then that's where we go back to that impairment piece as well. Like, is it getting in the way? Like, is their magical thinking getting in the way of like, being with their friends because it looks pretty different from their peers. Is their magical thinking getting in the way of like communicating with their parents? And this feels so much more different than what we would typically expect to see at a kid that age. Uh, it was a great talk. I have actually a question for both of you. Um, so Maria, in your slides, you sort of hinted at the fact that, um, you know, in some ways, anxiety doesn't always OCD is its thing, anxiety isn't always necessarily a part of it, in some ways hinting at the fact that kids with OCD don't just always have OCD, they may have something else going on. They may have depression, they may have another anxiety issue going on or not. For each of you, short, succinctly, could you talk about how do you handle the messiness? How do you handle um, when a kid with OCD has more than just OCD um, in either current clinical work or hoped for collaboration or in your kind of research? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, particularly because we work at these higher levels of care in partial and residential, uh, at least 90% of our kids are coming in with another comorbid diagnosis. That's um, typically another anxiety disorder, but often also includes a depressive disorder and can certainly range to all the other comorbidities. Um, ADHD is the other thing that we often see in residential because of how impairing it is an outpatient to treat a kid with OCD and ADHD. Um, so we fortunately, unfortunately, are actually really used to dealing with the messiness of the comorbidity. And so you, we may find that we tend to pull sort of a more transdiagnostic approach there, and that's also why we pull in all the other evidence-based modalities that we use and figure out, okay, what other skills might this kid need to shore up so that they can effectively do exposures? And in the case of like our ADHD kids, kind of the first thing we'll look at is like, are they undertreated medically for their ADHD? And is there a way that we can optimize their medication so that they can engage in the exposures? And so for any of the comorbidity, we are looking at, okay, how is this impacting their ability to engage in their treatment, and do we have to treat that first? before they can really do the exposures? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, again, from the research perspective, you have, you know, 90% overlap. You know, what, what's the same and what's different is a real challenge. And, you know, just like we're looking to use brain areas to separate within OCD, we're also trying to find, you know, what's similar across disorders as well. You know, how could we combine, you know, treat some treatments for OCD, for anxiety, for ADHD versus what's separate? That's really the challenge we have looking forward is uh, what's, what's the same and what's different. And, uh, we've you know, had some exciting results of some overlap across multiple anxiety disorders, and it'd be great to be able to pull OCD in that in the long run as well. We're, we're looking in those directions, both with regard to symptom level, but also pulling in things like genetics, again, neural activation, and all sorts of other markers that are out there. So I have a question <clears throat> similar to that. Um, in your machine learning model, you said you identified kind of three clusters or three groups of different types of patients. Um, at least in, cur in terms of their neuroimaging data. And I'm curious, along these lines, were those three groups of patients different clinically in any way, either in terms of their manifestations of OCD or their comorbid diagnoses? Yeah, in fact, that was a, a super surprising and interesting part of this to us that I didn't show here, is they were not superficially different, actually. So they had the same rates of depression, anxiety, uh, severity of OCD as measured by clinical uh, measures. So on the outside, from a clinical perspective, we could not tell the difference between them starting out. And so in a way, we were very surprised by this because we, we would have thought, you know, maybe there was a pattern of, you know, one type of comorbidity or another. But as it turns out, we found that in a way this shows the value of doing a brain scan that you really can't tell just by talking to someone or by looking at them what's going to happen next. It gave us some new insight. but. Uh, it's a great question that we were, we were quite surprised by in the, in the results. Anybody else? Anybody else going once, going twice? If we don't have any other questions, I want to have a final round of applause for our two speakers. Thank you so much. And uh, we appreciate it. And we will hopefully see people next week for Grand Rounds again.